Hello, um, my name is Rachel Cedar. I'm a, a fellow at the Center of Law and Trans Social Transformation in Bergen and a professor at Ciencias in Mexico City. And I'm delighted to welcome everybody today uh, to the annual lecture on the rights of indigenous peoples uh, for the occasion of uh, Sami National Day in Norway. Um, this lecture and the debate which will follow are hosted by the Center of Law and Social Transformation in Bergen, um, which is linked to the Christian Mikkelsen Institute and the University of Bergen, and also hosted um, by the Bergen Sami Society. And we are delighted to welcome um, as our speaker for the lecture today, um, Mr. Francisco Calizai. Um, Francisco is uh, currently the um, UN Spe Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and I will introduce him now before I uh, then introduce the speakers who will follow him. Um, Francisco Calizai is Kakchikel Maya from Guatemala and he has extensive experience in defending the rights of Indigenous people. Uh, both in Guatemala, but also at the Organization of American States and at the United Nations. Um, he, uh, I've known Francisco for many years and he was the founder of many different organizations of defense of mind people's rights in Guatemala. Um, he's also held government posts. He was ambassador of Guatemala to the Federal Republic of Germany. And for four consecutive periods of four years, he was the president of the UN um, Committee uh, for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which is a treaty body at the UN. Um, also in Guatemala, he was Director of Human Rights at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and he was a member of CODISRA, which was a presidential, is the Presidential Commission Against Discrimination and Racism Against Indigenous People in Guatemala. Uh, he also um, was president of um, the National Reparations Program for Victims of the Internal Armed Conflict in Guatemala. Um, and we are delighted to welcome Francisco today to share with us um, and speak about the issue which um, we're all going to then be debating in a panel following his intervention, um, which is on violent land conflicts and indigenous peoples. And to discuss with Francisco um, will be uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Tatiana Alfonso from the ITAM uh, in Mexico City, and Eva Maria Feldheim, who is a Sami scholar at the University of Tromsø uh, in Norway. So without further ado, I will hand over to Francisco. We're all very much looking forward to hearing you today, Francisco. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Raquel. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be introduced by you, uh, uh, very good uh, and high academic, uh, women, academic women. So thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the invitation to participate in this great event with the participation of great academic women and jurists. It is an honor for me as a special reporter on the right of indigenous peoples to speak in the framework of the beginning of the celebration of the National Day of the Sami people in Norway, that I believe it starts tomorrow. But anyway, I, wa I want to take this opportunity to send my sincere congratulations to the brothers and sisters of the Sami people of Norway, of course, to thank them for all the work and contribution they have developed in, the, in all fields politically, culturally, diplomatically, and uh, the acad academic uh, work and international cooperation. Happy day to all uh, the people belonging to the Sami people of Norway. And now I will speak on the issue that uh, I was uh, invited to. So the right of indigenous peoples, uh, we can see that this is a range from the right to speak their own language, practice their own culture, participate in national international policies, have their, uh, their neighborhood or municipality organization, to have a council or a parliament as those the Sami people. The right of indigenous peoples uh, have over the past uh, four decades become an important component uh, of international law and policy. <clears throat> 
as a result of the International Indigenous People Movement, this effort was to try to reverse their historical exclusion, marginalization, exploitation, racism, and racial discrimination. Today, we can see that the reflection of this effort, uh, it has been in the regional human rights bodies, such as the African and the Inter-American human rights system. And of course, the discussion that has been taking as a result of this discussion are the resolution on the European Parliament. Today, we can see diverse areas as the environment, including climate change, intellectual property, and trade, human rights, and business. Of course, food security. That is why I am uh, of the opinion that indigenous people in the exercise of their rights should be free from racism and racial discrimination. And I am stating this because uh, all what uh, indigenous people have suffered mainly on historical injustice as a result of the inter alia, the invasion, colonization, and dispossession of their lands, territories, and resources, preventing them from exercising their right to development in accordance with their own needs and interests. The only way to overcome on this situation is that indigenous people choose the way of development as a people, but controlling also their lands, territories, and resources to and strengthen their institutions, cultures, and traditions, and to promote their development in accordance with their aspirations and needs. On September 13, 2007, a, a historical event took place, was adopted the Declaration on the Right of Indigenous People, and in the one paragraph of the preamble, it is stated that convinced that the recognition of the rights of Indigenous people in this declaration will enhance harmonious and cooperative relations between the state and Indigenous peoples, based on principle of justice, democracy, respect for human rights, non-discrimination, and good faith. And uh, despite uh, the way of thinking of the states, which uh, in the beginning and today, the argument that they have, uh, some uh, states have uh, for not the, for not recognize the rights of indigenous people, is that uh, the recognition of the rights of indigenous people is will create a co national conflict. And at least uh, from my point of view, it is the recognition of the right of indigenous people is the, the non, I'm sorry, the non recognition of the right of indigenous people is the trigger, trigger of conflict. So that's why I believe that the uh, declaration is one instrument that is going to create a peace uh, situation in all countries. And, uh, and of course, I believe uh, in what uh, another preamble uh, article, it said that affirming further that all doctrines, policies and practices based on ad advocating superiority of peoples or individ individuals on this basis of national origin or racial relations, ethnic or cultural differences are racist, scientific or false, legally invalid, morally condemnable, and socially unjust. This paragraph is also one of the preambular uh, 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 paragraph of the International Convention of the, for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. For many centuries after the arrival of the invaders, colonizers, indigenous people were dispossessed of their lands and territories and displaced to unproductive land that were desired, that were not desired by the colonizers. However, in the middle of the last century, the natural, the natural wealth that were maintained in these lands, but the lands are not only natural resources, uh, natural resources to exploit, there is much more than that. There are the trees, biological diversity, rivers, which represent life, not only for indigenous people, but for humanity. It's, it is worrying the, to see that we are reaching the time that our grandfathers told us when they told, when the rivers, lakes, and seas are contaminated, you will try to drink oil. And then you will see that the, the work 
or the effort that you have done to salt your land is not worth it. Water is becoming a resource of privilege. They are privatizing. Uh, we can see that the things that once ran large stream of water, now they are empty or contaminated. We are seeing how companies are buying water to, to the state without their population being aware of these processes. This affects everyone, not only indigenous peoples. The protection of the environment, the land and ter territories of indigenous peoples that the indigenous people occupy today should be a concern not only of indigenous peoples. It must be protected, protected by all. The lack of territory control put indigenous people at risk. Food security and land security are also inseparable. inseparable. There is a link between the right uh, to territories and resources and bio biological diversity. The right to land, territory, and resources are mentioned throughout the declaration, notably in the preambular par paragraph six, stressing, stressing genuine effort to restore land, territory, and resources. The importance of access to resources to allow the development of, and wealth which was part of the right of to self-determination. And we can see also Article 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 37, and 40 of the Declaration that calls on the state to create independent mechanisms with indigenous people to resolve disputes. I'm not going to go through all uh, the paragraphs of, of the Declaration. Uh, because I believe that you have been read uh, these paragraphs. So that's why I, I, I will go on. And I have been seeing almost in the end of the first quarter of, ten, of the 21st century that uh, we, can, we will consider the respect for human rights has advanced the declarations of the indigenous people's right, all the international instruments that defend the, the indigenous people's right can see or allow us to see that uh, the, the, the human right of indigenous people will be more respected. However, the situation of the violation of the rights of indigenous people is getting worse every day, mainly due to land tenure. In indigenous land are the largest reserve of natural wealth and large foreign capital has been launched for their appropriation. The situation of, for indigenous people in the pandemic uh, has been worsening. The measures that have been taken to contain the spread of the virus affect some more than others. A state of exception has been taking advantage of, of, of by some uh, have been taken advantage by some government and international comp companies to take over their the uh, or to not to comply with international obligation to carry out the prior free and informed consultation to obtain their consent according the convention 169 indigenous people increasingly fear for their lives and also the lives of their family while they seek to defend their lands and the environment. During lockdown, particularly where a state having uh, broadened their laws through declaration of emergency, and in some cases, a state of emergency have been used as a basis for targeting particular groups or individuals on individual and for criminalizing indigenous people's right defending activities. Restrictions on the freedom of movement and assembly, including bans on protest, have hampered the work of indigenous human rights defenders, journalists, and civil society, creating a void in their ability to monitor and draw attention to human rights violations and abuses. The suspension or restriction of core operation has impeded access to justice or remedy for indigenous people when it's when, when it's going to benefit the indigenous people. But if it's against the indigenous people, justice, justice operates immediately. This has been opening the door for companies or criminal networks to take possession of indigenous people land without scrutiny 
or accountability. Lockdown measures, limit the ability of indigenous right defenders to mobilize their emergency support network for the protection of members of indigenous communities. While authorities and private actors continue to gain wider abilities to silence them, for example, by criminalizing them for breaking quarantines as they prevent incursion on their land. Confinement has increased the exposure of land environment defenders to attack and killing. Indigenous leaders were reportedly assassinated in almost all corners of the world, especially in Latin America and Asia. In, uh, in this pandemic, you will see that some state has been taking as excuse the stop of the spread of the of the virus and they have been using this as a, a national security emergency instant to see that what we have we need in this moment is the health national emergency to attend all the needs of all the peoples of of the nations we can see uh, in this moment that the violence uh, uh, and brutally is known or, or, or the violence and, and brutality have been launched against indigenous people is worsening in this moment, especially because indigenous people are trying to defend their lands. Many peoples, indigenous peoples who are living in borders, can, have been experienced how the lockdown is prohibiting them to cross borders where naturally before they were crossing freely especially uh, the pastoralistic people, indigenous people, have been suffering these measures that have been taken by the government. Land of indigenous people, as I was saying, as I was stating, have the wealthy, the natural wealth that today is uh, uh, the one of the objective of the uh, international uh, business companies. And, and you can see in this moment how indigenous land has been taken over by those business uh, uh, companies to build dams, to uh, for 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 exploiting minerals, uh, to create uh, uh, the so-called green uh, uh, energy plants. So what we are seeing in this moment is that there is a new wave of invasion on indigenous territory and land. Land is not only resource for indigenous people. Land always has been the main link between indigenous people and mother nature. As we always stated, indigenous people have not seen the land as one object that we are going to own. Indigenous people have been seeing land as a human being, part of this nature. In this moment, what we are seeing is that uh, uh, there, there is an attack on indigenous people land, but also indigenous people um, is survi is sur survival. Indigenous people frequently raise concern about systemic and structural racism and racial discrimination from a state and its authorities. This action is clearly manifest itself in several ways, such the way that public authorities treat indigenous people in official offices, and of course, the unnecessary questioning by the police, condescending attitudes of teachers to students, or rudeness from receptionists in a government offices. At their most extreme, this form of dis uh, racial discrimination lead to gross violation of human rights, rights such as murder, rape, and other forms of violence or intimidation. Human rights defenders who are defend the right of indigenous people of land and territories are suffering persecution. Clearly, the people who are suffering more are women and children, and of course, elderly. Now, we are, are seeing how the, the government has criminalized the protest of indigenous people to defend their rights. And what uh, is uh, really needed in this moment is uh, dialogue and consultation. It, 
there is a need that the government establish mechanisms and processes for comprehensive dialogue and consultation with indigenous people to obtain, not only to obtain their free and prior informed consent in relation to any project that will have an impact on their territory. It's a need to create a peace environment among or between indigenous people and government, especially to resolve the problems of land and territory ownership. To recognize the land and territory of indigenous people is not going to create a danger of uh, dividing the territory of the state. Mainly when indigenous people are asking to the recognition to the state is because they feel part of that state. Because if not, if that is not going to be uh, the, the, the way of recognizing the indigenous people's uh, uh, right of, for land and territories is when conflict is going to come. So that's why my suggestion is that uh, in this moment, what we need is that government, the state, recognize the right of indigenous people's land and territory. With this, uh, I will end my participation uh, for you. And thank you very much. And I hope to have a very constructive dialogue uh, among ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Francisco. Um, that's um, great and sobering. Um, to start us off in our discussion, if I could ask Eva and Tatiana um, to turn on their microphones and cameras. Um, fantastic, thank you. And um, um, just to uh, start our, our discussion, um, now I would like to ask Eva, seeing as, um, well, we are, we are convened here today in honor of, as Francisco is right, tomorrow being um, Sami National Day. And Eva, I know that um, Francisco has talked about a number of issues affecting land and resources of indigenous peoples, and um, particularly the impacts of global warming. I know that the impacts of global warming on the Sami in the Arctic are particularly severe. And um, maybe if you could just tell us something about the struggle of the Sami for land and particularly the moment that we find ourselves in now. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Rachel. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this very interesting panel. And thank you to Mr. Francisco Kalitzai for the very interesting uh, lecture on the pressing issues going on in the indigenous world. And I must say, uh, it is an impossible task to give the full picture of the situation of the Sami, as we are a nation spread and divided between the colonial borders of the Nordic countries and the Russian Federation. Um, we are a united people, but we are also very diverse. But I will try to provide you with a perspective uh, based on my research and um, engagement uh, in Sami issues, uh, pro predominantly in the Norwegian side of, of SAPMI the Sami ancestral lands. And uh, before uh, maybe starting uh, talking about the land conflicts, I would like to share some reflections uh, about um, the term violent conflicts. That is the headline of this uh, uh, lecture, uh, because indigenous peoples in different parts of the world, they experience violence in different ways and to different degrees. But they are all somehow related to similar colonial structures uh, still present in the relationship between uh, the peoples and the states uh, in which they reside. As we have heard uh, Francisco talk about in this lecture, um, he has mentioned the crucial role uh, of the control of territory um, in order for indigenous peoples to freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. And he also speaks about um, criminalization, restriction on movements, violent repressions and forced evictions. And in the Nordic uh, context, at least, uh, it has not been very common to, to use the term violence when discussing the historical and ongoing conflicts between the Sami and the state. Um, throughout history, we have had few violent uprisings and, and no civil wars. Uh, 
But at the same time, the way we conceptualize and understand conflicts in SAPME uh, is also changing. And scholars and activists are increasingly analyzing um, this increased pressure from a wide range of industries uh, on indigenous Sami lands in the context of colonialism and as expressions of structural racism and even cultural genocide. So again, um, it's important to define and contextualize the violence we are talking about. Um, in many ways, indigenous peoples in, for example, Latin America and the Nordic countries in Europe uh, live, under in, live under incomparable uh, conditions in economic terms and health, access to health and education, uh, political marginalization and physical repression. Um, and these are the comparative lenses that we often use when we defer uh, the situation of the Sami from other indigenous peoples. And uh, we mustn't forget that they are very real. However, um, concluding that some peoples suffer more than, than others, others may make us blind to the different forms and mechanisms of oppressions uh, and the consequences that they have. So taking a step back then from this common understanding of uh, the concept of violence, uh, there are emerging perspectives providing us with a wider understanding beyond the, the physical attacks. Um, for example, as conceptualized by uh, Christina Celine McNeil in her research on extractivism on both Sami and Aboriginal lands in Sweden and Australia, where she defines uh, extractive violence as a ca category of violence uh, on its own as a form of, of direct violence against people and or animals and nature caused by different extractive industries, which predominantly uh, impact and affects people closely, living closely uh, to the land. Um, she also refers to Johan Galtung's concepts of structural and cultural violence that helps explain how Sami also are exposed to violence through, for example, the lack of recognition of land rights and racial uh, racist uh, aggressions in relation to land conflicts. So after reflecting on how violence can be understood in the Sami context, uh, what kind of, of conflicts uh, are occurring in Sápmi? Uh, my ongoing research is focused on how extractive industries affect reindeer herding in the South Sami areas on the Norwegian side of Sápmi. Reindeer herding is an ancestral Sami livelihood important for sustaining Sami languages, identity, knowledges, and the close relationship between humans, uh, animals, and the nature and the land. And the Reindeer Herding Act recognizes the state's obligation to safeguard reindeer herding as the material basis for Sami culture. And this is also uh, recognized by the Norwegian constitution supported by international human rights frameworks. But despite this legal protection, the cumulative impacts from a, a, a wide range of industries constitute what reindeer herders uh, term a piece by piece politics, meaning that the land is increasingly being dispossessed and fragmented by the development of roads, railroads, hydropower, power lines, uh, mining, military activity, tourism, and the list goes on and on. Lately, as also mentioned by Mr. Tsai, uh, is the, um, the increased uh, green economy uh, emerging and the extension, the expansion of the wind power industry in particular in the Nordic countries. And this has encroached on what can be seen as the last refuge for reindeer and Sami herders. In Norway, uh, the industry is mainly located in the mountain areas. Um, which sustain uh, important pastures and migration routes for reindeer. And these same areas have only recently become valuable uh, for capital interests. Uh, for the Norwegian government then, uh, the expansion of the wind power industry is part of a green transition agenda to confront the threats of global climate change. Uh, but Sami reindeer herders, uh, authorities and activists, on the other hand, claim that um, the industry is re represents what is green colonialism through the continuation of colonial dispossessions of Sami territories, livelihoods and rights, now only in a new uh, green wrapping. The green transition model uh, even brands mining as green as it provides minerals uh, which are essential for electric cars 
And one of these mines, the Nussir copper mine project in Finnmark County, will not only affect crucial uh, reindeer herding pastures, the company is also allowed to dispose mining waste directly into the sea. So the critique from Sami authorities uh, of this green uh, label being put on both new and old industries points out a neglect of environmental and, and cultural impacts caused in the name of, of climate change mitigation measures, violating Sami rights to self-determination over lands, uh, territories and resources, and the right to practice uh, Sami culture. And according to the Norwegian Sami parliament, uh, this uh, green colonialism occurs when renewable energy is developed without the, the, the consent and fair benefit sharing of indigenous peoples. And that indigenous peoples suffer from the double burden of climate change, uh, climate change itself and also its mitigation measures. Um, so as the wind power industry is expanding and the conflicts are intensifying, the uh, the impact uh, of wind power on Sami reindeer herding is now increasingly, is increasingly being discussed in courts. And uh, I want to mention a recent court case concerning uh, the Fusen wind project, which is uh, uh, now the Europe's largest onshore wind power complex uh, on the reindeer herding lands of the uh, Fusen Jarke community. Um, the court ruled the company to pay the highest compensation uh, amount in history to compensate for the negative impacts from extractive industries on Sami reindeer herding lands. However, um, this was to compensate for the loss of crucial winter pastures by paying for expensive infrastructure and resources necessary to feed the reindeer with processed supplementary fodder during the winter. Uh, so the Fusen Sami um, sustain this is an emergency solution or uh, a necessary evil as it ruptures with the fundamental basis of ancestral reindeer herding, making use of seasonal natural pastures um, through annual migration routes. Uh, in addition to risking animal welfare and poorer meat quality, it alters with fundamental relations uh, between herders, reindeer and the Sami cultural landscape, which is crucial for strengthening um, identity and maintaining ancestral ecological and cultural knowledges. Uh, so the Fosen verdict illustrates in many ways the, the conflicting perspectives on what constitute a green and sustainable future. And it challenges and a challenge of safeguarding the cultural sustainability and self determination of reindeer herding communities facing extractive industries on their lands. And it raises the fundamental question um, of who has the right to determine what constitutes an un unacceptable impact on Sami cultural practices and livelihoods. As this question uh, remains unresolved, uh, as a growing amount of cases are entering the courts, illustrates, illustrating as well the unresolved land rights disputes and an unsettled colonial relationship between the Sami and the Norwegian state regarding increased encroachments on ancestral lands. And the, the extractive then structural and cultural violence occurring through what is perceived as a boundless peace by peace politics from a Sami perspective uh, is a way of depicting the current conflict, uh, conflicts over lands in Sápmi today. And how these conflicts can be understood also in relation to the violence experienced by indigenous peoples elsewhere in the world, I think is well illustrated by reindeer herder uh, Jung Christian Joma, who comes from the Fosen Jarke community who fights against the Fosen Wind project already mentioned. I quote, in America, they shot the Native Americans. In this country, we are tortured to death, piece by piece, our lands are disappearing. So I think I will end uh, yeah, my, my intervention with this quote and we can yeah, follow up with the discussion later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eva, um, for, for that overview for us and also very rightly um, for reminding us that violence is not easily uh, described, conceptualized, and that we need to also be having a conceptual discussion about how we understand colonial violence uh, 
over the long term <laughs> and its impact. Um, if I could turn to ask um, some questions to Tatiana Alfonso. Tatiana, when Francisco was talking, um, he mentioned Latin America together with Asia as one of the regions of the world where we are seeing most violent attacks against indigenous peoples and territorial defenders. And um, certainly the trends of criminalization of community defenders, of uh, the organizations that work with indigenous peoples seems to be increasing in recent years. And I know I asked Eva impossibly to talk about all the Sami people in 10 minutes, and I'm gonna ask you even more impossibly perhaps to talk about the whole of Latin America for us briefly, but um, if I could ask for your reflections, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it seems like a difficult task um, to fulfill in 10 minutes, but I'm, I'm just going to uh, try to um, build up on something that Eva said at the beginning of her intervention and also on um, the issues that Francisco tackled in, in, his, um, in his keynote. Because, of course, like we have so much diversity in the region um, and it's complicated, but, uh, but we can try to build some sort of typology to understand the types of uh, violence that affect indigenous peoples in Latin America. And I think it's also, uh, as Eva said, uh, there's a lot of uh, commonalities with um, other indigenous peoples in different regions, right? And so um, I'm going to try to... <laughs> Um, talk about the different patterns, but just to try, like to show a typology, uh, trying to understand how, um, first of all, that like colonial, stru colonial structures manifest in different types, as Eva said. Uh, so it's useful for us to understand what are those types of violence. And um, as you also said, Rachel, violence is actually a difficult um, concept to tackle. So, of course, we talk about different types of violence. So I, what I would like to say or to show is how different type of, types of violence and conflicts in Latin America are um, organized or we can organize them along the types of actors that we have. Uh, but what the common factor between different types of violence in Latin America is the um, struggle for land and especially for autonomy, which I think it's, is something that uh, Francisco mentioned and explained very well. Um, so I, I, I'm just gonna talk about those types and um, I would like to show how, I, I'm not really sure that in the past few years, uh, the violence is more, is increasing uh, but at least it's more visible. And I'm gonna say why that's of course so problematic and uh, worrying, but also it's a, some, so it marks a light that we can follow uh, to try to enforce and strengthen indigenous people's rights and protections. So the first um, thing that I would like to say about uh, the pattern in general is that we can see um, at least three types of violence and conflicts in Latin America. The first one would be the, the conflict between the states and indigenous peoples. The second one would be the conflict between indigenous peoples and armed actors or illegal actors that uh, exercise armed violence. Um, and also we can see conflicts between indigenous peoples and private legal actors. And so, and that marks different types of extractive economies or extractive violence, as um, Eva said, citing uh, Christina Celine, Celine's work. Um, but uh, what is uh, interesting or puzzling is that um, even when you have those types of conflicts, the main uh, variable uh, that is common to them is actually the struggles for autonomy and equality. And so I would say that for for the conflict between the state and indigenous peoples, what you what we see is basically an axe in which the conflict develops um, along the claims for autonomy, uh, which are usually translated into claims for land or land struggles. You know, so as Francisco was saying, the recognition of indigenous peoples' rights to land and territory um, is crucial, um, and that's of course like the the first part of the cycle of rights, then when those claims are uh, pursued by indigenous peoples, the states usually, or at least Latin American states have 
usually um, threaten back indigenous peoples with, first of all, lack of recognition. And once there is recognition, what we see is how racism permeates and shapes all the contention between the states and indigenous peoples. And then the state starts uh, start posing uh, obstacles for indigenous peoples to get recognition of the land, their land rights, or when they get recognition of land rights, then the next struggle is uh, that states uh, impose obstacles for indigenous peoples to be autonomous in their lands, right? So it's uh, like at least a two-step two um, struggle and path. And then in each of those uh, points of the contention between states and indigenous peoples, the type of violence that the state exerts uh, is different. So the first in the first phase, uh, the states, Latin American states, seem to exert a type of violence that is more symbolic to the extent that it's of course uh, it responds to uh, racism and racial discrimination. So they start denying all those claims for land. But once they get legal recognition, some sort of uh, recognition of uh, uh, land, then autonomy is blocked. And then that's when we see, or we seem to see the pattern is not absolutely clear, but it's, there seems to be a pattern when we see more criminalization. Once they have those rights, then you see that state starts criminalizing more people or more often indigenous leaders um, in order to block all those claims for autonomy. No? So that's the first um, type of conflict. The second one would be between indigenous peoples and armed actors, which is a, a, a violence that is more known, I would say, or more um, known by other people in which uh, different armed actors in different contexts in Latin America try to exert territory control uh, in order to pursue their uh, illegal economies. So it seems that um, in several countries of Latin America, you see the same tension. Um, and even when those um, armed actors are illegal and they pursue illegal economies or informal economies sometimes, um, the, the violence and the conflict between indigenous peoples and those actors are of course different because in this case, instead of being the state criminalizing people, is armed actors threatening and killing people in huge amounts. And actually, um, in the last index of violence against environmental activists, Colombia and Mexico are the countries that are at the, are the top of the list because of the number of activists um, killed. And 40% of those are indigenous peoples or were indigenous peoples, right? So it's not a minor number. And of course, it does coincide with the type, with the form of the distribution in land rights. Um, and the third type of, um, of conflict is, of course, between indigenous peoples and private legal actors, which means, of course, that we have different extractive economies, illegal economies, and legal or legalized economies that pose um, different challenge for indigenous peoples. And that's where, and that in that um, type of violence is where the legal recognition of indigenous rights to land is crucial for one reason. Like with art actors, you don't basically negotiate any right, right? It's just like strong um, physical violence. But with those private legal actors, then you have if you have a legal recognition of, um, of rights, then you have more tools to fight all those impulses to um, extract natural resources basically from their um, territories. And at the end, this is also like the three of them are uh, conflicts that are triggered by claims of autonomy. And I can see, for example, in Colombia, we can see the cycle in which as soon as Afro-descendant people actually obtained uh, legal recognition of their territorial rights, the violence started to hit them so hard. And it's, so you can see, if you wanna see the cycle, it's like legal recognition in the first phase in Latin America has always triggered violence, physical violence against um, indigenous peoples and Afro-descendant communities, right? And then afterwards, the thing is that without legal recognition, it's actually more complicated for indigenous peoples and other communities to fight back. So we would still, uh, right, we would still need 
um, or consider the uh, legal recognition of rights um, very important because without that, fighting back is just more complicated. Um, so when we see those the three types and we understand that the right to autonomy is in the middle of, of that, we can see how um, all the, the indigenous people, indigenous communities are responding to that. And then I would say that in the last decade, at least, uh, sometimes you see more violence, but it's just not more violence. It's more legal recognition and therefore like the trigger, like the, the, the immediate effect of violence against it. And of course, there's also like a matter of a method and it's, a, it's just more visible, which is a good thing. Um, that's what I anticipated at the beginning of the, my intervention is that having the violence against indigenous peoples more visible in terms of activism and in terms of um, legal claims to the states makes also easier uh, to fight back against the violence, right? Um, and that's something that you can see, for example, in the index of envir environmental activists, at the beginning, they were not differentiating the type of activists. And now it is important for us to know how many of those victims uh, were members of indigenous communities, because you can show what's the actual impact in terms of um, magnitude, right? Um, and, um, the final point that I wanted to make is that right mm -hmm. now there is um, an important like new impact uh, in terms of violence related to the pandemic uh, because it is very it, it has been very clear at least in Latin America how and the state measures that um, states are implementing due to the pandemic are creating a condition more um, that makes for different types of factor more and easier to commit violence against indigenous peoples and there are at least uh, three different manifestations of that the first one is of course that uh, mandatory lockdowns in different countries of latin america uh, affect indigenous peoples because it's mandatory for them as for any other citizen in the country. But of course, it's not mandatory for any armed groups. Uh, and that's uh, creating um, factual situ a, a situation of an actual lockdown in which armed actors just find people in their houses or in their territories, right? in this lockdown. So it's easier for them to kill them and threat them. So for example, in Colombia, the number of homicides is, um, has increased just because it's easier for our, our actors to find um, indigenous leaders in their in their places in their houses. No, um, the second manifestation is that exercising the right to autonomy. So many co indigenous communities in Latin America, and this is especially true in Colombia and Mexico, um, have deployed their indigenous. Uh, police or guardias indígenas in order to avoid the spread of um, of COVID-19. And that makes them, that has uh, left them in the front line of armed actors. So, so you have both situations, like you are, you are in a mandatory lockdown, so you are locked down in place, and it's easier for them to find you and kill you. And, and, and the numbers have increased uh, significant, significantly in a significant way uh, in the last year, right? And the second one is that they are exercising the right to autonomy. So they are trying to control how who's entering and who's leaving the territory. And that makes that they are putting in the front line all the people, uh, which also makes them an easier target to, to get. Um, and of course, the third manifestation is that the impact of the pandemic on indigenous peoples is this like really disproportionate compared to other groups of population, which because of course the structural racism that we know it's in place, so it makes that indigenous peoples have less access to the health system, and of course if they have less access to the resources that makes um, at least more like easier to combat um, COVID-19. So the impact in terms of health 
and um, death is just being um, very disproportionate without states having any measure to address that. Um, so I would say that this last string is uh, even more complicated because it's not different in the type of structure uh, and in the structure of violence, uh, but it's just uh, deepening uh, the situation, the complicated situation of indigenous peoples in terms of violence, threats, and resisting um, to do that violence. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatiana, for, for mapping that out for us and for, yes, you know, the different kinds of threats that are facing Indigenous peoples and, and particularly uh, how those long-run threats are being accentuated now in the context of the pandemic. Um, if I could turn to Francisco um, Carly to ask him to lead us off for the second and last round of reflections before I open up uh, to questions from the audience, which are already coming in for us. Um, to ask about the, the value of international human rights law. Um, Francisco, you talked uh, uh, eloquently about the importance of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but also mentioned that we now have um, you know, a battery of norms on climate change, on intellectual property rights, um, important advances being made on questions of obligations of businesses to uphold the human rights of the populations that their, uh, their, their operations affect, and particularly for indigenous peoples. And, and certainly in terms of international soft law, we have a huge amount of different codes um, from mining industry right through um, to the um, World Bank, etc. So we have lots of regulation. And it seems as if the regulation has um, definitely got more advanced and more sophisticated and stronger in terms of defending indigenous people's rights to land, territory and resources, certainly than it was, um, say, 30 years ago. Um, can you reflect for us on, you know, the current, <laughs> the value of where we've come in terms of uh, regulation in terms of international human rights norms for indigenous peoples um, and reflect on that in relation to this ongoing colonial violence and in some cases you know more visible uh, more visceral violence that we've heard about from Eva and Tatiana. Thank you very much, Rachel, for, for this uh, uh, new round of questions. I believe that um, the pandemic is one of the uh, worsening enemy of humanity in this moment, but also has given us the opportunity to communicate more easily and faster. And that's why you are in Mexico, Eva is in, in Norway, I am in Arizona. So that means that uh, now we have this opportunity. And I, I agree in, a, in, a, in one way with Tatiana when she said that uh, now it's more visible uh, the human rights violation against indigenous peoples. But uh, beside that, and your question is uh, some, I understand that, uh, or I understood that uh, your question is that why there are more violations of human rights of indigenous people when we have a better uh, instrument for protection of the indigenous people's rights. First of all, I believe that as I stated in my first intervention is that uh, uh, in the middle of the, uh, the last half century, the last century, of course, 20, uh, 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 century 20, they discovered a wealth in the indigenous land. And now, because it's more visible, it's impossible to hide a human rights violation as in the 80s and the 90s in Latin America or in Asia. <laughs> 
even though that uh, we were able to denounce uh, and to be public uh, to make public all the atrocity that the indigenous people have suffered in those days today i believe this lack of political will that state and also the uh, business companies had to respect human rights of indigenous peoples it's clearly that there are more instruments to protect indigenous people's rights it's obvious and uh, of course in this, and that's why indigenous people they have been appropriated those instruments and that's why they are speaking out more than before and that's why i believe that is now it's more visible of course but uh, the targeting of leaders and the spokesperson of indigenous people are very clear and that's why and and the, uh, and the thing is that they are trying to reproduce the colonial messages you kill the leadership so then the community or the rest of the people are going to be afraid so they are not going to speak out the problem that uh, those companies and states are uh, confronting in this moment is that is today is not only one leader the, now now they are growing the leadership of indigenous people and that's why there are more people who are speaking out more about the situation of indigenous peoples so now even youth in this moment are speaking out men women are together speaking out on the situation of indigenous people so i don't know if answer i answer your question or not, but i i would be happy to answer more questions if you have more thank you thank you francisco um yes um definitely in terms of more people speaking out um, and more voices that it's impossible to ignore. I think we see from indigenous peoples the world's over and particularly um, indigenous youth uh, and elders um, reflecting together on questions of the climate emergency and the fundamental importance of the respect and recognition for indigenous peoples, lands, territories and resources in order to tackle the climate emergency. I mean, you mentioned in your, um, your discussion, uh, your, your, your keynote speech about water resources, about biodiversity resources, things that are fundamental for the future, the future survival of the planet. And this is something that indigenous peoples have been saying to us forever. Um, so perhaps we are at a moment um, in the crisis that we face as a planet that we are um, at least able to listen more to indigenous peoples, hopefully uh, to take more action. If I could pass back to Eva um, and ask Eva for you to reflect a little for us um, from the situation of the Sami on the, the usefulness um, and the limits of international human rights law and domestic law um, for protecting the vision of the world uh, that the Sami have. Yes, I can try. It's a, it's a very, very difficult question. And it's also a question that I am reflecting on with other uh, yeah, um, reindeer herders and other uh, scholars. And um, I think in the Norwegian context, uh, we still have a long way to go to implement uh, international indigenous rights framework in in, in courts and uh, in legal cases. Um, it is still very un invisible. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, considering the question of why are we now viewing more conflicts, seeing more conflicts over in particular land, lands? Because in the Sami context, even though I should be careful to generalize. I think it, many would agree with me that when it comes to territorial rights uh, is where we still haven't resolved <laughs> a lot of the injustices, uh, historical injustices. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I think um, another explanation also is that 
even though we have a strengthened uh, legal uh, protection, we also have um, a growing um, global capitalist economy that is still growing and is uh, requiring even more and more resources and looking for resources in places that were not um, viewed as, as, uh, as valuable before. So I think this increased demand for growth and also, of course, uh, subsequently affects the, the lands of indigenous peoples that hold a lot of these resources. So I guess uh, if you see it that way, like the, the strengthening of the, of the, the legal framework uh, it's not catching up with the rapid expansion of, 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 of the growth model that we are, are seeing. And this is also the model that uh, indigenous peoples are challenging and also in this climate change uh, debate. And uh, I've also seen it in the policy work of the Sami parliament that they are questioning this growth model uh, and, um, and also kind of claiming to include indigenous people in, this, to, in defining this, <laughs> this model. Uh, and um, yeah, um, I think that is uh, one of the things that I, I, I find interesting. Thank you so much, Eva. Um, if I could turn to Tatiana and ask you, Tatiana, along the lines of the same question, which is really the value of law in the current context and, and maybe over the long run. Um, Latin America is perhaps one of the regions where we've seen the most resource uh, recourse to the courts by indigenous peoples, organizations, and they're one of the strong cases, if you like, of judicialization in the region. And, the, and Latin America as a region also has you know, a fairly dense um, body of national law recognizing to different degrees and extents uh, indigenous peoples' rights. Um, and yet, as you said, although um, violence is structural, racist violence is structural um, and has been there against indigenous people since the beginning of colonization. Certainly it's more visible, it seems more visible now. And, and, and some of the things Eva has, has said about the acceleration of, the, of this extractivist growth model, certainly we seem to be seeing all over the place in uh, Latin America. So uh, could I ask for your thoughts on, on law as, as as a means of defense, as a tool for resistance. Yeah, you can ask me, I don't know if I, have, I, I don't have a clear answer. No, I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, my take on that is the, is the following. I, of course, like the, the baseline is that legal recognition and rights are not gonna solve any issue or by themselves, right? It's not, a, it's not a, an enough tool for, uh, breaking this long history of um, racism and structural discrimination. But as Francisco said, and the pattern of uh, recognition and violence seems to show, um, it's always better, I mean, without legal recognition and without rights, it's just more difficult and complicated to have um, the struggles to fight back. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that I there's the usual gap between the recognition and the enforcement of those rights. As you said, in Latin America, you see an, a very significant um, number of laws, types of laws, um, different types of recognition. And it's very like in some context, the recognition and the rights granted to indigenous peoples are very impressive for international standards, right? And yet, uh, the enforcement of those rights are um, basically um, shaped by the structural violence, right? Uh, the good thing is that I like to think, as a sociologist, I like to think about social change in an interstitial way, because it's you're never going to, especially when you have this pattern of um, long history of discrimination and structural exclusion, exclusion, you're not gonna see like a rapid change in the pattern, right? But then you can see how a legal recognition of different rights for indigenous peoples can create um, dynamics of interstitial change. So basically you, you see uh, small steps and changes within the system. You're not gonna change the system. You're not gonna break um, the structural, um, 
part of the conflict, but you can see different um, steps in order to um, have autonomy, because I think at the, at the end, the fight that states are resisting and other actors are resisting is the fight for autonomy, which is the fight that indigenous peoples have lost in the international scene or landscape, right? And lost to some extent, because there's the, this recognition of a consult, a prior consultation is actually one of the cases in which you see, okay, so you're granting consultation, but you're not granting autonomy. And as uh, indigenous peoples fight back saying like, we do want autonomy in our territories to define our lives, then of course the states and other actors are resisting to that. So in that uh, specific contestation, I do think that uh, the role of rights uh, is very, very important because then you can fight back and you can see like in those trajectories of uh, judicialization, which are very different in different countries, of course, like you have Colombia, which is this huge um, amount of cases in courts and all these great decisions by the constitutional court and then huge and massive violence against indigenous peoples, right? And then Mexico in which the judicial power doesn't seem to be ready to recognize all the extent of the um, rights of indigenous peoples, but then you have strong uh, processes on the ground of people claiming autonomy. So I think that having rights and the legal recognition of them is actually a necessary condition for obtaining autonomy. It's not suf a sufficient condition, but it is a necessary one. And maybe I didn't answer your question, but that's what I think. No, you did. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Um, if um, we're in agreement, we've got about 23 minutes left um, and we have some questions from, from the audience. Um, so let me read um, some of the questions. The questions first from Constanza Ramez, um, who says, hi, I have the impression that Sami people are hardly ever talked about, even in indigenous people's topics, even here in Sweden. This makes me think that there are other peoples that have more coverage and leading to think that Scandinavia might be treating their indigenous peoples better. Do you have any opinions about this? Uh, I'll read the three questions and then we'll go around and see who would like to answer which. Um, the second question is from Siri Glopin. Hi, Siri, um, who says, thank you for the amazing and enlightening lecture and presentations. It's very interesting to learn how the challenges both remain and shift as the geographical perspectives change. I would love to hear more about how important international exchanges and networks are for the strategies adopted locally in Latin America and in the Scandinavian countries. And um, the last question um, from Noé Mendoza, who says, if the cycle of legal recognition and violence that Tatiana mentioned does exist, and I think it does, would it be wise to recommend to any attempt of local autonomy to prepare for armed resistance? Or is there any hope in some sort of international cooperation? Um, Francisco, would you like to lead us off? Well, thank you very much, uh, Ra Rachel. And it seems to be that it's true that uh, that uh, it, it, you don't hear much about uh, Sami people struggle. It seems to be, but that is not true, uh, because uh, uh, Sami people have been able to transmit uh, their messages among indigenous people movement. And this is, can be a, a link to the second question: How we can networking networking our, uh, the, the the indigenous people um, struggle? I remember 1975 in Guatemala, first uh, Sami people delegation. 1976. Yesterday we had, uh, a, I think, uh, a, I think. Uh, 46 years of the earthquake in Guatemala. Sami people were the first indigenous people who were present there. Since 1976 in Guatemala, the Sami people have been in very close relationship with the Mayan movement. 
Uh, and I believe that it's not only with the Mayan, I mean all Latin America and other parts of the world. That's just, uh, just talking about uh, this uh, situation. But the work that Sami people, Sami parliament and Sami council have done in United Nations, is amazing. How they have been showing their support, not only uh, among themselves, but also to the other indigenous uh, people movement. And of course, indigenous people around the world have been showing the support to the Sami people struggle. It's true, there are different uh, uh, conditions, but the situation are similar. <laughs> Land problems, uh, environment, uh, uh, in, uh, freedom of movement. Uh, uh, in some cases, uh, I know that uh, the violence is not the same, that uh, uh, physical violence, I, I'm, I mean, because there are other type of violence that is affecting some people. And <clears throat> in concern of the third uh, question, I think that in Latin America, and I, I think also in, in Asia, indigenous people have tried to be involved in ar armed resistance. Results, massacres. Results, almost exterminio, I'm sorry. Revelation. <laughs> uh, yeah, of indigenous peoples. We had been, uh, or the indigenous people had uh, experienced all the stages of resistance. And what uh, indigenous people are seeing in this moment is that uh, it's prefer preferable to go to the courts, even though the those court and this, the justice system is not responding of the interest of indigenous people, indigenous people have been learned how to use that justice system. And uh, I remember in the 90s and uh, the 80s, I don't know, uh, I, I give an example of how we are using, or how indigenous people are, were using the, the justice system. Indigenous people are starting to learn how to play basketball. But after that, the system put indigenous people to, to play basketball in a football field. And it's the same uh, that the system of justice is the same way. So the thing is that, but indigenous people learn also how to play basketball in a football field. And that is how indigenous people are being adopted or adapted into the different stage on the justice system of the, uh, in, the nation, in each country. So I think that uh, for my, in my perspective, or from my point of view, it's better to go and using the instrument that we have in this moment, because we had, and the indigenous people had also uh, experienced the armed conflict. Thank you, Francisco, for such a full answer and reflection on that, and so eloquent. Um, Eva, can I pass the microphone to you? to respond to the question yes. you would like to. Thank you. Well, um, starting off at least with the first question that was directly about uh, the Sami case. Um, I, I share the, the reflections of, of uh, Mr. Tsai, uh, considering uh, the, um, the, the Sami presence, uh, especially in, 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 the, in the UN history. And I think that uh, whether or not the Sami case is known in the world depends a lot on where, on what kind of, of, of um, place um, we are talking about. Um, and um, but I also uh, understand the, the, the question raised here because uh, that was, I think, the point uh, that I wanted to make also in my intervention that it can be the consequence when we do um, that kind of comparison uh, between the, the situation of indigenous peoples in, in different places. And in the Sami context, this, this has maybe uh, led to the um, our struggles uh, also uh, becoming um, more invisible or maybe more difficult to to detect uh, somehow because uh, there are other mechanisms uh, that are uh, creating this kind of, of, of uh, violations, human rights violations. Um, 
I also yeah, share what, what uh, Mr. Tsai said. Uh, uh, I think that when indigenous peoples meet, uh, it's easy to understand each other and to understand uh, also the struggles of the other independent of, of the differences. Um, uh, but yes, uh, uh, I think that uh, what the question is referring to is, is this kind of consequence of, of thinking about the Sami as something different and, and also um, kind of residing in, in, in a more um, democratic and, and uh, stable uh, states, uh, so to speak. But yeah, it's, it's interesting to, to reflect on this. Thank you, Eva. Um, Tatiana, can I open to you? Yeah, thanks. I would like, it's um, maybe I'm not the authorized person to talk about the question of the Sami people, but I just I wanted to say something about that first. And is that when we don't hear about um, a specific uh, indigenous community or a specific indigenous struggle, uh, what I think it happens is that uh, all the mechanisms to make those uh, struggles invisible are working right so you see it, what you see is so many people that are not regularly interested um, in the rights of indigenous peoples or that they don't have any contact with indigenous peoples right or they decide to ignore so it's basically we don't know that those people exist so it's the same type of mechanism in which states and some um, institutions construct official memories and official narratives in which they decide to make invisible some facts. Um, so I would say that that's something that um, we need to remember very often to understand why some struggles are seem to be more visible or less visible than others. Uh, but I, well, I might. Yeah, I think that like Sami people are very present, especially in, in the international construction of, um, of um, different instruments, right? So, but in general, what you see is just like the construction of official memories are making some struggles invisible. And um, I, I, I absolutely agree with Francisco um, regarding the last question on the armed struggle like the results of those attempts um, have been tragic for indigenous peoples it's just um so much violence that you reproduce and then you don't actually get any you don't obtain any uh, any autonomy or you not you don't obtain any of the goals um that established at the beginning of the fight but also uh, like i think we need to remember that any time that a group of population uh, that is um, historically uh, discriminated, has tried to use uh, um, any type of armed uh, struggle, the way in which states and societies judge them is way stronger and harder than with any other people, right? So then you see, and that's very clear in any protest of indigenous peoples or Afro-descendant communities, in the north and in the south so every time it's like all oh, these violent people that are not violent like when you see you go and see the archives the images all the actions the repertoires are not violent and still people judge them out as violent because they are replicating of course the racialized structure in which uh, discriminated populations are supposed to be violent. So it's actually more complicated and so for both reasons, uh, for the um, substantive results of those struggles and also for the implications for the struggle against racism, I would not, it's clear that, I mean, or at least in history, that those uh, paths have not worked. No? And on the other hand, um, networks of solidarity uh, for rights and the entire attempt to construct an international order to recognize uh, rights for indigenous peoples seem to be or, or have showed better results historically for indigenous people's uh, welfare. Thank, thank you, Tatiana. I'm just looking that there's a cl uh, clarification from Noe about her, her question when she said she wasn't necessarily meaning armed struggle, open armed struggle against the state, but thinking more about some of the uh, experiences of autonomous institutions you mentioned, oh. actually. Ah. One of them in your talk, the Guardia Indígena in El Cauca in, in Colombia. Um, and we could think of the uh, 
community police in Guerrero, in Mexico, as another example. And there are a number of examples um, across uh, the world, not just Latin America. I just happen to know some of the Latin American examples of uh, autonomous police forces, um, indigenous people's forms of self-governance. And I think perhaps maybe that was what she was asking more than taking up arms against the state, although sometimes that's, as you say, interpreted in a, in a highly discriminatory and racist fashion as a form of taking up arms against the state. Can I say something about that? Yeah, th thanks for the clarification of the question. I think that's very, I mean, that's also a different um, situation and structure. Uh, and all those autonomic institutions or organizations um, are not, armed in the traditional sense, right? With some exceptions, of course, with policias comunitarias in some parts of Mexico, most of the exercises are technically armed, but just as any other police, right? Uh, so, I, but I would, I would, I think the best way to refer to those exercises of autonomy is actually as an exercise of autonomy and a social organization that comes out of the um, autonomy or autonomic organization of the communities rather than armed uh, resistance, right? Because it's, it is resistance, but it's actually pacific. It just happens to use or to mimic the organization of a different agency or institution of the state, which is a police or guardia, no? Thank you, Tatiana. We have um, some eight minutes left. Um, so I'm going to go around in reverse order so that I'll ask Tatiana, then Eva, and finish with Francisco. Um, and um, ask you, uh, now that we've heard this panorama um, on the occasion of Sami National Day, uh, of the problematic of um, access to land, territories, and resources for Indigenous people, and we've heard that we have um, some better instruments, we have more visibility, um, we have more networking, um, but we also face incredibly complex and difficult situations of long running structural uh, discrimination and racism as a form of violence, um, but also the impacts of the pandemic itself. It's tragic reading the news I was um, reading yesterday of um, different indigenous groups in the United States and just how disproportionate the impact of COVID deaths have been on those communities and how many um, of the elders are being lost through this situation. Um, some of the experts in everything, culture, language, but particularly um, in, in the Southern United States where Francisco is, it seems particularly bad. So um, my question, my last question to all of you is just kind of two minutes on um, where we go from here. Um, the challenge is ahead and um, the kind of themes that we should be thinking about, work that we should be doing as academics, as activists, um, on indigenous territorial rights um, in, the, in the months and years to come? Tatiana, I know it's an impossible question. In two minutes. Uh, a bit impossible. Well, I'm, especially because it came out of the blue, so I don't know. No, um, I think that, well, it's, it depends on the corner that you are, right? Uh, like in the corner that I am, which is very marginal, like academia, it's a committed academia in where I am, but it's still marginal because it's academia <laughs> anyway. Uh, but I think like from this corner, um, there's one task that we are, we need to um, to develop soon and it's, um, actually good information on, for example, the impact of the, um, of the pandemic on indigenous peoples. That's something that we say all the time and we're still trying to gather all, all the data. Uh, and the first obstacle that we face is that we don't have the data. So in so many countries, you don't have uh, reliable uh, statistics, numbers, and qualitative cases of what the impact is and how disproportionate is how differential is. So then uh, we, we need to start um, to be more systematic on that. 
And I guess that also we need to be more systematic in showing the links between indigenous struggles and violence, symbolic state and physical violence for one reason. That's always what's challenged by states and other actors. It's not, it's not because of that. It's because of something else. And it's the same with racism and racial discrimination, right? It's like, it's not because of that. It's like, it is because of that. But we need to uh, work better to um, demonstrate the link, which we know it's true, but we still, um, I think we, we can still do a better job in doing that. And finally, like from the, the marginal corner of the committed and politically committed academia, I think that we can um, walk along indigenous peoples and indigenous communities in building that agenda to autonomy, towards autonomy, uh, which is something that so many state agencies uh, still resist, right? So there's still a lot of um, instances in which uh, the agencies of the state recognize indigenous peoples within the racist framework of uh, exotization or uh, inferiority. And I guess that we have uh, good tools to contribute to that um, struggle from like this uh, corner, as I said. And that means, of course, being more in contact with um, different international organizations and also uh, to work very closely with indigenous communities rather than from the desk, which is the old way to do it. Right? Thank you, Tatiana. Okay, more data, stronger causality, critical methods ever. One minute, <laughs> please. Hi, I just want to say that I agree with everything that Tatiana mentioned, and I will certainly take that uh, with me in my further work. As I think all of us uh, is feeling a lot of times in these um, crazy times is that we it's almost enough only to stay on the surface to try to, <laughs> to, to manage the situation. Um, but I think that it's a good opportunity to, to, to make some changes in the way we think um, as a society, but also as researchers. And I'm thinking a lot about this, uh, how to work to make more visible the contributions uh, from indigenous peoples to this sustainable future that we are talking about, but we are not, um, we're not agreeing on what on the terms and, and the content of, of this future. And, but I think that uh, slowly, um, this is uh, changing also in the, in the awareness of people. And um, I think that uh, a crucial uh, issue in, in the Sami context, at least uh, here on the Norwegian side of, of SAPMI, is to look closer at how to, to strengthen the, the, rec the recognition of land rights, uh, especially in the, in the southern parts uh, um, of Norway. And um, it will be really interesting to see now we have a truth and reconciliation process going on uh, and that we will close in a few years and uh, what will come out of that will be really interesting. But the feedback now is from many communities that this process need to address this uh, injustices uh, regarding rights or else it will be difficult to reach a reconcil reconciliation. So yeah, I will keep reflecting on your question. Thank you. It's a good one. Thank you, Eva. Francisco, can I hand over to you for, for the last word and thought, please? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Uh, I will just uh, link some terminologies. I'm not going to define land, territory, environment, self-determination, recognition of indigenous peoples. And I think that in this moment, the impact of COVID-19 is very disproportionate, especially on indigenous peoples. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Francisco. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Tatiana. We have come to the end of our time for um, this webinar for Law Transform and the Sami Society, but um, I'm very honored and um, delighted to have been able to chair this meeting today and thank everybody that has listened um, to us, sent in questions and will listen to us because we will be up on the website um, for a good while to come. Um, so again, we thank very much Francisco Kalitsai, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur 
on in the rights of indigenous people, Eva Maria Felheim from Tromsø University and Tatiana Alfonso from the ITAM in Mexico. And we hope to see you again at Law Transform soon.